Killers of the deep. Shark, shark, shark! Vicious man eaters. The shark was just throwing me from side to side like a rag doll. Hunting machines. Then I saw that her arm was gone. Jaws. Deadly labels for deadly creatures. The great white shark. The bull shark. The tiger shark. Together, they are responsible for the majority of attacks on humans. But do they really deserve their sinister reputation? Naked Science asks why sharks attack humans and uncovers the truth about these incredible ancient survivors of the deep. Sharks are among the planet's most ancient predators. They dominate the waters, attacking almost anything that moves. Even a gentle pulse could mean a possible meal. But the truth is, sharks are not indiscriminate killers. Despite our paranoia, sharks actually only attack an average of 75 people a year, killing only 10. Meanwhile, we humans slaughter millions of sharks each year. And yet, we're the ones who are afraid. And when we talk about these killers, the usual suspects are the legendary Great White, the tenacious and stout Bull, and the voracious Striped Tiger. They attack to get food, but when they do attack a human, are they really out to get us? In 2003, an attack by a tiger shark on teen surfer Bethany Hamilton shocked the world. Family friend Holt Blanchard was in the water with Bethany when she was hit. We paddled out about 7.30, so it had been light for probably at least an hour. It was just a normal day. I was just laying on my board relaxing, not really doing anything. We were all probably 15 to 20 feet from each other, just sitting in a little group. My left arm was just dangling in the water, and this arm was like holding the nose of the board. Bethany hadn't the faintest idea that in the water below her, a tiger shark was preparing for attack. Like Bethany didn't really scream or say, you know, anything. The first thing I heard her say was that she got, she got attacked by a shark. I didn't really get time to see it. Like, all it did was, like, attack me for, like, two seconds, and then it went under. The first thing I noticed was there was a lot of, you know, I saw the blood in the water. When I got up to her, I, then I saw that her arm was gone. A two-second attack, and then the shark vanished. Why didn't it come back to finish her off? And why did this shark choose Bethany? Was she a tasty-looking morsel? or merely a victim of circumstance. In California, one man thinks about sharks a lot. The reason that tiger sharks, white sharks, and bull sharks attack human beings is that they are designed to attack large prey items at the surface. Ichthyologist John McCosker has been working with sharks for over 30 years. This is the renowned Steinhardt Aquarium, where macabre rows of pickled specimens point to McCosker's passion for marine life and sharks. He keeps thousands of specimens from all over the world in this lab. Staff calls this the sharcophagus. These are specimens that are large to fit in the jars. 
You see, there are more than 400 living kinds of sharks in the world. 30 of those have been involved with unprovoked attacks on human beings. McCosker believes that in most cases, sharks bite first and then back off, allowing their prey to bleed to death. After they've made that first attack, that bite upon their prey item, in some cases they release their prey item, in some cases they don't. Actually, only about 7% of attacks result in fatalities. And that's because of the shark's normal behavior. Where a seal or turtle might die from blood loss and then be eaten, fortunately for us, this behavior gives human victims time to escape to dry land and medical attention. When an attack on humans is reported, the first suspect is the great white, and rightfully so. Statistics show that the now endangered great white is responsible for 37% of all reported attacks. Bull sharks and tiger sharks are responsible for far fewer. But while great whites attack most often, they're the least likely to kill their victims. Tigers and bulls are far more lethal. Their attacks often lead to irreparable physical damage and ultimately death. Still, these statistics measure only two factors, bites and kills. They don't explain why sharks prefer not to eat humans. If they don't want us for food, why are we getting attacked in the first place? And why are such incidents increasing from decade to decade? One possibility may be the growing popularity of water sports. More and more people are crowding into the shark's territory. Many shark biologists believe that it's not that sharks are getting more interested in us, but that our paths are crossing more often. And more than anything else, surfing seems to attract sharks. Unfortunately, there's no scientific data to help us here. But as ichthyologist Dr. John McCosker points out, attacks could be a case of mistaken identity. A surfer silhouetted against the sky looks like a seal or even a turtle. In the case of the tiger shark, we get on a belly board, we splash around offshore at the same zone that the large oceanic turtles are swimming. Perhaps this explains the attack on our young surfer, Bethany Hamilton. And yet statistics show that surfers aren't the only victims. Wherever we are in the water, so are sharks. Great whites choose cooler, temperate waters where the surf is up. But thanks to cheaper vacations in tropical locations, tigers are your likely neighbor. But overall, swimmers are most likely to encounter the bull shark because they like the same warm waters we do. And unlike all other sharks, they are physically adapted to swim in both salt water and fresh. Bulls have been spotted hundreds of miles up rivers, like the Mississippi, and they roam freely in inland waters, like Lake Nicaragua. Oceans, rivers, lakes, that list covers just about anywhere you hope to swim or enjoy the water. Sharks are everywhere, and more and more, so are we. But we still don't know exactly why they attack us, if they don't really seem to want to eat us. Bethany Hamilton's arm is gone, and she's stranded a quarter of a mile from the beach. Holt Blanchard uses his board leash to make a tourniquet on what remains of her arm. They paddle back, no time to think of another attack. It's kind of weird. None of us really thought about the shark at all. We just got, got to Bethany and got her up on the reef. By the time she reaches the hospital, she's lost half her blood volume. By a strange coincidence, her father, Tom Hamilton, is about to undergo knee surgery, just as Bethany is rushed in. Family friend and surgeon, Dr. David Rovinsky, has to break the news. A nurse ran in and said that there was a young lady 
on her way in who'd had a shark attack. But the news isn't. Tom knew immediately that it was Bethany by the look on my face. It's the hardest news to relay to another parent about an injury to their child, also a potentially fatal one, because at the time I found out I didn't know if she was going to make it or not. Naked Science is diving into the water with the trio of sharks most feared for their attacks on people. Bull sharks, tiger sharks, and the infamous Great White. The aim? To find out how, why, and where shark attacks on humans occur. And what's provoking this terrifying trinity of fish? Is it shark hunger? Or have sharks developed a taste for human flesh? When 13-year-old Bethany Hamilton was attacked by a tiger shark, the surgical team battled for hours to save her life. Damage to her arm was severe. The possibility exists that she may grow and the bone may lengthen faster than her skin can adapt and it will tent the skin and require another operation to shorten the limb. The tiger shark that attacked her had such powerful jaws and sharp teeth that it was almost as if her arm had been amputated. As in this demonstration, even tempered steel can't cut as cleanly. If I were to try to cut off a young person's arm using a bolt cutters, I would end up splintering the bone because I couldn't apply the force quickly enough to do a clean cut through the bone. Sharks pack two deadly weapons, sharp teeth and the awesome strength of their jaws. Each species has evolved teeth and jaws specific to the prey they hunt. Tiger shark teeth have evolved to be like saws to cut open turtle shells with ease. Such teeth have no problem with relatively soft human bone. Bull shark jaws have adapted to ensnare both fish and mammals. Their teeth tear flesh apart like cheap rags. And the great white, the ultimate jaws, mug their prey with one big bite. Their teeth slice like steak knives, perfect for seal blubber. These three species have such honed weaponry for their respective prey that even the lightest touch of the teeth can seriously damage people. Before her attack by a tiger shark, Bethany Hamilton had already won 21 surf contests, and she isn't about to give up her medals. She still surfs competitively. It's pretty rare to get attacked by a shark. I mean, it's not very common. Like, I mean, I'd be more scared of getting in a car accident than like, getting attacked again. Well, they're not out looking for people, but they're a, you know, they're a carnivore and they're a predator, and you take your life kind of into your hands when you go surfing. Nobody saw the shark that took Bethany's arm, but neighbors are incensed by her attack. They catch this huge shark and declare it the culprit. The people who caught the shark, about it was about a week later, or 10 days later, what they told me was is the jaw from the shark fit into the board perfectly. So they were like 99% sure it was the shark that attacked Bethany. But it's rare for victims to be able to identify their assailant. Our young surfer certainly didn't see anything. If I were being bitten by a gray shark eight to 10 feet long, as an ichthyologist, I'd have a heck of a time telling you what species it was. Now, new science proves that hunting suspect sharks is not the answer. At the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, Dr. Kim Holland has spent years monitoring where tiger sharks go using special underwater listening stations. Sharks don't simply park in one place. They go literally hundreds of miles between the islands, and it might be months before they come back to that place. There is no legitimate way of saying, okay, we're just gonna catch the sharks that live off of this beach 
and make it even safer than it already is because the shark that was here today will be 100 miles away tomorrow and the shark that was 100 miles away yesterday is here today. Sharks are opportunistic. They move around and go where the next meal is. But what of their meal preferences? Is human flesh on the menu? Sharks are adapted to eat a variety of prey. get attacked. Bull sharks feed on fish, birds, and sometimes small mammals. Warm-blooded great whites prefer a high-calorie diet, one of the reasons they're thought to target blubbery seals. And tiger sharks are known as the garbage cans of the ocean. They'll eat just about anything. A really good way of thinking about tiger sharks is to think of them as, a, as the wolf or the dog of the ocean in the sense that wolves and dogs are, are omnivorous. They will eat carrion, dead animals, if they come across one, but they will also hunt. Tiger sharks are the ultimate opportunistic feeders, using their mouths to investigate anything that they might be able to eat. The bad news? When a mouthful of teeth like these clamps down on you, it doesn't matter if the bite was intended to kill or not. Any bite can be deadly. Tiger sharks caught around Hawaii are famous for having all sorts of junk in their stomachs, from lumps of coal to boat parts, even license plates. So attacking a human isn't much of a stretch. We emit the electrical pulse of a heartbeat. We sometimes float on the water's surface like a seal or turtle. And for a shark, what we call swimming may be seen as a flashing neon sign saying the diner is open. But can shark diet tell us anything about how deadly they are to humans? Perhaps knowing what sharks eat is a step towards understanding why they sometimes attack people. In the past, the only way to analyze the contents of a shark was to kill and gut it. But now there's a better way. In a unique experiment, never before tried on a wild tiger shark, Holland attempts something a little less fatal. A camera designed for looking inside humans, he hopes to confirm what tigers actually eat. But first, he has to catch a willing patient, a wild tiger shark. Now the question is whether or not we can take this basically piece of human medical equipment and take it into the field in the comparatively rough and tumble circumstances that we have to experience if we want to go into the open ocean and do this kind of stuff. Marine biologist Yanni Papastamatiu has the unenviable task of feeding the probe into the jaws of a wild tiger shark. He plans to take advantage of a quirk of shark biology. When you flip a shark upside down, it passes out. Well, what we've done in the past is with reef sharks is we found we can capture them um, by turning them on their back, they sort of go into a trance-like state. They basically go unconscious. It's called tonic immobility. It's much like giving anesthetic to a human patient before an operation. The shark is out cold. After the initial few minutes where they're basically coming out of their tonic immobility, they swim both in terms of speed and, and where they are up and down in the water column exactly the same way as they are swimming days and weeks later when for sure they haven't had any trauma. The first task is to catch a tiger shark. Overnight, Kim Holland's team put down 30 hooks two miles off Honolulu, Hawaii. This morning, 10 sharks are on the lines. It looks painful, but Holland insists that this method of capture is not harmful to the sharks. 
large sharks make a living by feeding on other animals which have got spines all over them. Oftentimes in the gum you'll find complete stingray barbs embedded in the gum tissue. So having something very sharp and toxic even in your mouth is something that sharks experience almost every day. In fact, there is a myth that sharks have such high immunity that they don't get cancer. It's not true, but sharks' resistance to infection is impressively high. And yet something as simple as turning it upside down is its Achilles heel. Once on its back, it lapses into a state of tonic immobility. Holland's team uses this peculiarity to their benefit. It's not simple, but they flip one of the hooked sharks over. Once it's done, the shark completely relaxes and seemingly goes to sleep. But very quickly, they realize there's a problem with the first fish. It's got a stainless steel long line hook that has caused a festering wound. We only use normal black metal hooks, which even if we have to leave it in the fish, it'll Ready? rust away and fall out. So this fish already had a hook in it before we caught it. The safety of the animal is paramount, so the team removes the hook and lets this one go. Naked science is wading through a tide of myths to find out why sharks attack humans. Our search for clues turns to diet as we try to find out if sharks even have a taste for human flesh. An experiment is underway to attempt to see if it's possible to look inside the belly of a wild, live tiger shark. If we know what the tiger is eating, perhaps we can understand why they occasionally attack people. This high-tech endoscope is designed for hospital use. It's heavy, and it mustn't get wet. One of the contradictions about working with large sharks is that you actually need to use small boats. You have spray, you don't have a big generator to use, so we have to go through all these inventive ways of taking, in this case, very high-end scientific equipment, but using it in a very small boat on a rocky ocean. Finally, the team has a shark flipped on its back in a state of tonic immobility. Papa Stamatiu puts a specially designed plastic tube down into the stomach of the shark. He'll use this as a guide for the camera and as protection for his fingers. But he takes his hand off the tube and immediately there are problems. The shark regurgitates it. The whole pipe. Yep, the whole deal just it shot it right out of its stomach. The tube is lost to the deep. As unpleasant as it sounds, regurgitation is a normal, natural way for sharks to clean out their system. In fact, that's the way that it's going to get rid of undigestible items from its stomach. So, for example, a turtle shell, which couldn't be digested, can just get regurgitated back out through the mouth. So it's a natural process for sharks, and they're actually very good at doing it. Shark number three, and a backup tube. This time, the tube is securely tied to the boat. But will it stay in long enough for Papa Stamatiu to get the endoscope into the shark? Finally, the team fires up the endoscope and takes a peek inside. The experiment is a success, of sorts. They have images inside the shark's stomach, but it's empty. Got it. Okay, so in other words, what you think you've got is an empty stomach, right? Yeah. In fact, drawing a blank is an expected result. One of the things that we forget as mammals, when we look at other animals that aren't mammals, is that we have a very high metabolic rate. We need to fuel it, we need a lot of food. Sharks and other cold-blooded animals aren't that way. They can make a good living not eating very often. For now, round one for this technique comes to an end. 
Holland hopes to repeat this in the future, to gather enough data to see conclusive patterns. The tiger shark has a low metabolic rate and doesn't have to feed very often. They have evolved to roam the nutrient-poor tropical seas and adapted to go long periods without a good dinner. On the other hand, it seems that this lifestyle may make them the ultimate opportunistic feeders. Could this be why they're infamous for eating garbage and sometimes attacking swimmers? Still, they don't eat people. They usually just bite. Could it be that they're curious, attacking humans as a taste test? Naked Science travels to Florida, where more shark attacks occur than any other place in America. Maybe sharks really aren't so innocent. At what point does idle curiosity become directed aggression? In 2001, the peace of these idyllic beaches transformed into scenes of terror. As sun seekers flock to the coast, multiple reports of shark sightings caused mass hysteria. In the media, it became the summer of the shark. Journalists and TV crews descended from around the globe to report at the scene. Journalists such as Jordan Kahn, well, this is the newspaper front that we ran um, in August of 2001, and there were literally every half a mile of beach or so, dozens of sharks, and you could see the size of the people here to know that these big black dots are about six-foot sharks, each one. In just two weeks, there were 16 reported attacks by sharks. Bull sharks were spotted everywhere, and they were coming right into the shallows, right where children were playing, and where Matt Crawford was surfing. The um, fish about that big hit my board while I was paddling for a wave. At the same time, something grabbed my hand, gave me a yank, pulled my hand up, and it was just dangling, and um, I had to accept that I was bit by a shark. But when you check out the statistics, it seems that something fishy was going on. In reality, there were fewer attacks in 2001 than in the previous year. The stats tell more about a media frenzy than a feeding one. Some believe that bull sharks don't just attack for food or curiosity. There could be another reason. It seems that bulls may be territorial. Research on some shark species suggests that you could be attacked for invading their space, a bit like how a dog may treat the mailman. We're threatening them. We are entering their territory. And they aren't mugging us like a white shark sneaking up behind us. They're doing all they can to threaten us, to warn us. They don't want to bite us. They just want us to leave. Male bull sharks have more testosterone than any other animal on land or sea. More than an Indy car racer, more than an angry bull elephant. Bull sharks are animals with attitude, the most aggressive sharks around. Even their name comes from their thug-like appearance and pugnacious reputation. If a bull shark attacks you, chances are it won't give up. Not only are bull sharks aggressive, they'll swim right into shallow water as shallow as three feet, the perfect place for bathers. And because they can survive in fresh water, they have no problem hanging around in the brackish waters at the mouths of rivers. Enter a bull shark's territory at your peril. Here he goes again. Aggressive, inquisitive, persistent. Bull sharks may not be interested in eating you, but we know they'll still attack. The biggest danger from sharks is being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Triathlete Chuck Anderson regularly runs and swims to keep in shape. A training session just like this nearly cost him his life. Swimming at Gulf Shores, Alabama, 
he never saw the shark until it hit. We'd been swimming about three minutes, and all of a sudden, boom, something just hit me from the bottom and flipped me over upside down in the water. Disoriented and bleeding, he fights to keep his head above water as the shark comes back for more. I put my face down in the water, and I had on a pair of goggles. And coming from the bottom was a, a big shark, and I threw my hands out instinctively to push off. And when I did, the shark took all four fingers off my right hand. By coming back for seconds, this shark is already demonstrating a particularly aggressive attitude. In most cases, sharks hit and run. They bite once and then back off. But this is a bull shark. It comes back for a third and then a fourth time, pulling him under. I can remember pretty vividly the fact that, that, that I could see the blue skies and, and the fact that the shark was just throwing me from side to side like a rag doll. Bringing him to the surface a minute later, it pulls him through the water with such force that witnesses think Anderson is walking. Eventually managing to free himself from the shark's jaws, he finds himself in knee-deep water and is able to escape. Despite the trauma of the attack, Anderson still swims, and he chooses none other but the same bay. I've done uh, 13 triathlons in the ocean since, uh, since my amputation, uh, since the shark attack, uh, but I'm, I'm a lot more aware of, of when I should be in the water. I know a lot better than to be swimming in the guff at 6.30 in the morning when it's breakfast time for sharks now. But why did this shark attack Anderson? We'll never know the exact reasons, but there could be a combination of factors. Sharks like to feed at dawn and dusk. They're more likely to go after a lone swimmer. And they are creatures of habit, acutely tuned to sense prey. Homing in on signals like the beat of a heart or the scent of blood. It doesn't take a lot. A great white, for instance, could sense a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And when a white shark attacks, it has you firmly in its sights. In murky waters, its eyes can resolve 10 times the detail of a human eye. Shark vision is a major part of its weaponry. Sharks are attracted to contrasting shades and bright colors. You may not know if a shark is in the water near you, but if one is, it's likely it has you in its crosshairs. Sharks have keen senses, a wicked set of teeth, and as far as most are concerned, they're completely unpredictable. The great white, for instance, the largest predatory fish in the ocean, can grow up to 21 feet, the size of a small bus. With eyes like coals and teeth like chainsaws, they are the image of terror. Yet the more we learn about them, the less they appear to be mythic monsters. They're just doing what they do, being sharks. Naked Science travels to Gans Bay in South Africa to meet this man, Andre Hartman, a one-time spear fishing champion, understands more than most about the subtleties of white shark behavior. First time I ever saw a shark, a great white shark, it was in 1977, after four years of competitive spearfishing. Hartman has just speared his unlucky 13th fish. Its struggle to swim free sounds like a dinner bell to a passing great white. Of course, Hartman doesn't see the legendary shark until it's almost too late. And the whole nose came up, and it just, the whole mouth just opened up wide, wide. And I could see right down the throat. I, I reckon if it could pause there, I could swim in, turn around, swim back out. It was that big. Hartman knows exactly what to do. He stabs it with his spear gun and smashes his fist into its eye. He keeps calm and lives to tell the tale. I lay there for five minutes selling my diving again. Never was I going to dive again. But the next day, you go crayfishing again, and you do things, you know. 
Instead of letting his experience put him off the Great White, Hartman turned near tragedy into opportunity. He now runs daily trips for tourists into the shark zone. Hartman's no scientist, but he's convinced that nearly a decade of daily contact with Great Whites gives him a better understanding of these magnificent creatures. Don't try this at home. And certainly, don't try this at home. Hartman made his name by being among the first to attempt the apparently insane. He swam with Great Whites outside of the cage. But to do this, the conditions have to be just right. Hartman attracts the sharks to his boat using a bag filled with shark livers. With their acute sense of smell, sharks can identify different prey sources from hundreds of yards off. Hartman believes that these sharks are tuned into the smell of shark liver and arrive looking for a dead shark on which to feed. When they come across a person in the water, they ignore him perhaps treating him as another predator. But just like people, sharks appear to have different inclinations, and Hartman will only get in the water with the sharks he deems relatively safe. And you know, you get various different types of sharks. Uh, each one is his own character. And you get these guys that swim around the boat, very neat, pristine, clean, doesn't even try to bite the bait. And then you get another guy, that's a real barroom brawler. Full of scars in his face. The whole body is full of scars. And uh, tries to bite everything. It tries to bite the engines, it bites it, breaks his teeth, turn right around and try and do it again. Though great whites attack more humans than any other shark, finding one is difficult. One good place to look is here. Mossel Bay, off the southern tip of Africa. If you take to the air over certain stretches of the coast here, there's a good chance you'll see something that takes your breath away. Great whites hanging out in the surf. Biologist Ryan Johnson explains. White sharks are based literally just on the breaker line of well-known and very popular swimming beaches. And the most surprising thing is, despite this incredible interaction between the two species, there's very, very few attacks here. Although thousands of people swim in these waters, surprisingly there are only one or two attacks by white sharks in South Africa each year. Johnson believes that in the surf, the sharks aren't interested in feeding. The white shark isn't always in this killing, fighting, predatory type mode. I really believe that when it moves to these areas where swimmers are, that they're possibly more in a resting mode, more relaxing, and they're definitely not interested in taking out or predating on uh, things at the surface. Great whites have to keep moving in order to breathe. Johnson believes that these sharks are resting, using the wave action of the surf to ventilate their gills. Just a few miles away, there are stretches of water where your next swim could be your last. False Bay in South Africa could be one of the most dangerous spots on Earth for a swim, where sharks literally launch themselves into the air as they make their kills. It's a good place to find out more about why sharks attack humans. We're four miles off Cape Town, where plump seals attract great whites, and both species engage in a game of cat and mouse. The aptly named Seal Island is home to tens of thousands of Cape fur seals. In winter, naive young seals venture from the safety of their island. Fast food for the sharks. Bite-sized portions of pure blubber. The sharks launch themselves, or breach out of the water, to grab their takeout food. Older seals seem to protect themselves, 
As they leave Seal Island, they maneuver defensively out to sea, diving and darting through the kill zone to avoid becoming a meal. You'll see when the seals leave the island, they generally dive right down to the bottom and scoot along the bottom to get out of that immediate dangerous area. After that, they sometimes do this zigzag type swimming, maybe to confuse the sharks. And all of this is done at very, very high speed. They don't mess around when they leave these islands. Injured seals are even easier meat. They don't last long. But why the sharks around Seal Island breached to kill remains a mystery. Great whites off America and Australia simply don't do this. Scientists believe that these African sharks are taking advantage of a layer of murky water along the bottom of the sea. They literally hide here, camouflaged by the dark coloration on their backs. When they spot a seal, they zoom toward the and right out of the water. The impact mortally wounds the seal, and the shark has a meal. It's the perfect attack, speed, and stealth. If we can witness an attack above and below the surface, we might learn something about why and when sharks attack. Now, Naked Science is on a mission to witness and film a flying great white. To do this takes a very fast boat and a pair of hawk eyes. It also means a start before sunrise, since the sharks get up early for breakfast. Did he see something? Did he see predation? Johnson is on hand to help spot this unique behavior. He knows that where there are seagulls, there are sharks. Yeah, we've got straight in front of us, we've got a bunch of seagull squalling. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yep, just happened. Okay, seal's still on the surface yet. On this occasion, the seal avoids a gruesome death. With the element of surprise now gone, the more agile seal escapes by staying behind the shark. If only we swimmers could do the same. It's hard enough to see an attack on the surface, but is it possible to see what's taken place beneath the water? Do white sharks strike opportunistically, or do they hunt like lions? Filming one as it breaches for prey takes luck and planning. A decoy shaped like a seal is towed behind a small, fast boat. And a high-speed camera to slow the action down six times is on board. We're armed with the latest technology to witness every split second of the attack. By capturing the breach on film and then slowing the film down, it's possible to accurately calculate the speed of the impact when the two-ton shark strikes the decoy. With a high-speed camera experiment, what we are trying to do is document the white shark at the limits of its capabilities by evoking this incredibly dynamic predatory behavior in which they speed up as fast as they can go, breach out of the water to catch his prey. Skipper Rob Lawrence has had success in the past with various decoys, but thin carpet is the best by far. It moves realistically through the water. So your experience is that you do get a good decoys, bad decoys? Oh, without a doubt. But the sharks can be slow to rise to the bait, and they're unpredictable. And that's a problem for the camera, which takes nearly a second to start up. And 
white sharks won't tell you when they're about to attack. Luckily, underwater cameraman Charles Maxwell has developed a torpedo cam. It's no guarantee of success, but it's a clever gamble. The only way we can get early warning systems is get a set of eyes into the water, and that is by using my torpedo cam. The streamlined waterproof video recorder gets towed backwards, 30 feet behind the boat, focused on the decoy. Even if the plan works, Maxwell has just half a second to warn the cameraman. Hopefully we will see the shark coming up towards the decoy, and then I will shout and the high-speed cameraman will start rolling. Okay, Rob. Maybe a little bit dark, but the sun is coming up the whole time. That's the surface there. It's a test of patience and reflexes. Blink and risk missing it. Don't run, it's coming on the torpedo cam. A big shark has taken the bait, but it's a false alarm. It's just mistaken our $4,000 camera for a fish, completely ignoring the decoy on the surface. Ah, oh, there's the problem, you see, when the shark hit it, luckily we didn't cut this cable. Oh, then we were lucky there. That's a bit of a flesh from the jaw. Not teeth. No, no, this is this is meat. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see if this will give us a bit of luck. Ten minutes later, with the torpedo cam repaired, it's time to try again. Oh. Success. A small breach, but a breach nonetheless. Just two minutes pass. Shark, shark, shark! Oh. <laughs> oh. Did you get him, mate? This unique footage from the torpedo cam shows the shark accelerating towards the decoy. Once the footage is slowed down, you can see the shark getting up to speed with five massive swipes of its tail. Naked Science calculates that this shark peaks at 19 miles per hour as it breaks the surface, twice as fast as the fastest recorded bull shark. At this speed, the Great White could even outpace an Olympic sprinter. The level of coordination on display is incredible. Apparently without effort, the Great White thrusts its jaws forward at the last moment to inflict its deadly bite. Apart from the athletics, the shots of the Great White show something else. These sharks don't just bite, they rapidly consume their prey. And yet when it comes to attacks on humans, they don't. They bite and move on. The evidence we've seen suggests that sharks may bite people, but they don't want to eat us. Attacks on humans are probably a case of mistaken identity, a product of curiosity, coincidence, and those jaws. There's not much we can do to stop shark attacks. Or maybe there is. Maybe if we don't swim at dawn and dusk, Maybe if we don't wear contrasting colors. Maybe if we observe warnings. Or maybe we just need to recognize that when we go into the shark's playground, accidents will happen.